in this class we will discuss about uh, the effective section properties in a cold form uh, steel section because this uh, concept is very important as uh, in the case of cold form uh, steel sections the entire width of the section will not uh, effectively take the compressive load or whatever moment is there so in this case we have to calculate what is called uh, effective width of that particular section and that effective width should be multiplied by the corresponding thickness of the element uh, to get the effective area of that particular element so that is why the computation of effective width uh, is very important in the case of uh, cold formed uh, steel sections so the concept of effective width can be explained with an example like this let us consider a compression element so this is a compression element so in this uh, when, when an axial compressive load acts uh, on this uh, section then the entire width of the section the entire width of this is the width a b c d e f uh, that is the entire width the entire width of the section will not be effective in taking the compressive load so only certain portion of the width only will be effective in carrying that uh, uh, compressive force so in this uh, i have marked here this whatever shaded area is there in that area in that width only that the compressive load will be effective you can see here so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and 7 8 so these are the effective widths in that for in this particular type of uh, uh, section of a compressive element so the other portion that is for example a1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so these are not so much effective in uh, taking care in carrying the uh, compressive load so the shaded portion whatever is there that resists the compression effectively so and uh, the other portions they are not so much effective that is why so if you take the entire width as b then b effective is nothing but this shaded width so that is b effective of course we can calculate the b effective using the formula uh, which i am going to explain later now in the case of a tension element this is the case of a compression element in the case of a tension element normally what happens this entire width of the element is taken as the effective width because uh, the, the full width will resist the tension force particularly in the case of a tension element whereas in the case of a compression element entire width will not be effective that is the difference why right? because in flexural members that is in bending elements only compression elements have reduction in width whereas tension elements will not have any reduction in width we have to take the full length for example here let us take two examples for flexural uh, members so this is one example so you can see that in the case of a flexural member uh, the beam uh, uh, the, that particular uh, beam so suppose if it is simply supported so whatever uh, portion is there above the neutral axis it will be subjected to uh, that is uh, compression so because the moments are uh, it will be acting like this if i take the moment acting on this uh, member m as sagging something like this in the case of a simply supported beam so then the portion above this neutral axis uh, uh, it will be subjected to compressive bending stress whereas the portion below the neutral axis is subjected to tensile bending stress so according to this concept uh, the compressive compressive portion in this portion so you will be you have to calculate that uh, b effective in such a type of section you can observe that this 1 2 portion and 3 4 portion it becomes ineffective the remaining portion that hatched portion up to this uh, so up to this it is compression so this portion uh, you, you have to take it as effective that means b effective is calculated by subtracting this portion 1 2 or 3 4 whereas if you take below the neutral axis it is subjected to tensile bending stress in that case b effective will be equal to b so the entire uh, width of the section uh, will be effective because it is subjected to tension so in the case of a bending element or a flexural element so you can see that one portion one portion above or below the neutral axis will be subjected to compression another portion will be subjected to tension so another example for a flexural member is this type so this is the uh, section of a cold form steel uh, section 
used for as a pressure member. Here also, if I take the moment acting on this pressure member as M, so whatever portion is there above the neutral axis, it is subjected to compressive bending stress. Below the neutral axis, it is subject to tensile bending stress. So that means above the neutral axis come in this compressive uh, portion. So a certain portion, for example, one two. So that portion becomes ineffective and the remaining shaded region so this becomes the effective so this plus this becomes the B effective in the case of compressive region whereas when you take up the tension portion entire width entire width so it is subjected to uh, it becomes effective and uh, it takes care of that uh, moment uh, effectively so that is how uh, you have to differentiate between the compressive and the tensile zones in a frictional member now all these properties, so these properties of these cold formed uh, steel sections, uh, whether it is like this or like this or like this, all these are available in IS 811, which you can refer. Now the next concept is local buckling coefficient. So this I have explained in the earlier video also. So this local buckling coefficient is a measure of the buckling of that particular type of element when there may be it, it depend it may be a stiffened element or unstiffened element so it depends like this value of k depends on the support conditions and also the type of element so type of element means stiffened or unstiffened support condition means whether it is free to move or uh, it is simply supported etc like that so as per the british report uh, bs5950 so you can calculate this uh, buckling coefficient uh, uh, in this fashion, there are I am going to explain for two elements. So one is liquid channel, liquid channel section. This is called as a liquid channel section and a C section. In some books they call it as C section also because these are the leaks. So these are the leaks. So this is called as a liquid channel section. So I will take this uh, width of this portion as V2, width of this portion as V1, and corresponding thicknesses as T1 and T2. And K1 is the local buckling coefficient for this web portion. K2 is the buckling uh, local buckling coefficient for this flange portion. So B1 is the uh, web uh, dimension. B2 is the flange dimension. So here, uh, as per the code, we can calculate the values of K1 and K2 using this two formula. K1 is the local buckling coefficient for the web bar is given by 7 minus 1.8 h by 0.15 plus h minus 1.43 h cube where h is the ratio of for b2 to b1 so it is a dimensionless uh, number so b2 by b1 is the value of h so once you know the value of h uh, substitute is that is the value of k1 and k2 is the local buckling coefficient for the planned portion which is given by k1 into h square into t1 by t2 whole square normally in most of the cases these thicknesses will be same t1 will be equal to t2 in that case this becomes 1 so k2 becomes k1 into h square so this is uh, for a liquid channel the value of k2 should not be uh, it should not be less than 4 that means it should be greater than 4 or equal to 4 or it, it should not be less than 0 0.4 to 5 Whichever whatever case it may be. So we have learned in the earlier video that so for stiffened element the value of k is greater than normally taken as we take it as 4 and for unstiffened element it is taken as 0 0.425. So that is the range, so that is the limit of the value of k2 you can have. This is for a liquid channel. For the second example, it's a plain channel without leaks. So we don't have any leaks here. So once again, B1, B2 are the dimensions of the weapon, the flange, T1, T2 are the thicknesses. In this case, K1, once again, K1 is the uh, stiffness, uh, that is buckling coefficient for this web portion. K2 is the buckling coefficient for this flange portion. So in this case, the formula is slightly different. So K1 is given by 2 divided by 1 plus 15 h cube whole square of 0.5 plus 2 plus 4.8 h divided by 1 plus 15 h cube. This is for a plain channel without leaks. So where h is once again the ratio of B2 to B1 and K2 is given by the same formula K1 h square T1 by T2 whole square. If T1 is equal to T2, K2 becomes K1 into h square. So this is how 
you can compute the buckling coefficients for the flange and web portion whether it lift, whether it is provided with lift or without lift so once you get the value of k you can find out uh, what is called as this uh, pcr value that is the critical stress value critical buckling stress value you can compute and then comparing this with the actual stress fc the actual stress fc you can find out uh, the value of b effective using suitable formula as per bs 5950 so in the next video i am going to explain you how to compute the stiffness coefficients for a given uh, cold form steel section so depending on whether it's a stiffened uh, element or non stiffened element you have to decide the values of for k values and then get the values of pcr using formula compare that with the fc value and then get the value of b effective using the respective formula the computation of b effective is very very important in computing the effective area of the section and also the in computing the load carrying capacity of a particular section so in the case of compressive uh, members we are going to calculate the maximum axial load compressive load that that section can carry whereas in the case of uh, a b element we are going to calculate the maximum moment that can be applied on that particular section for a given length of a beam